Uh, welcome. Thank, thank you for attending this second day on the International Multibrain Conference. Uh, I think today is going to be a really interesting program about more focused on uh, new technologies and digital solutions where we will have, I feel, very interesting discussions with the uh, companies too. So really looking forward. And uh, for the, this first session, oh, one thing, uh, uh, people that are connected online, please notice that the Zoom link is different from the one of yesterday. So this is just to note. So the this first session uh, today is about um, neurotechnologies and brain disorders. And we have uh, first line really uh, invited researchers uh, that I, I, I really expect this is going to be super interesting uh, discussion and fundings. The first uh, the invited speaker today is, um, is Dr. Christopher, Christoph Guger. He, uh, was, he has a background in electrical and biomedical engineering by the Te Technological University of Graz in Austria and also John Hopkins University in the US. And around 20 years ago, uh, Christoph uh, funded the GTEC company, which is a tech, uh, company that uh, develops brain computer interfaces and neurotechnology solutions, both for research and clinical applications. This uh, biotech is implemented in several countries, including Spain, and they have been involved in several international projects and trying to help people with uh, disorders of consciousness, stroke, epilepsy, and tumors, I think, amongst others. So with that, I'm really looking forward. Uh, Christoph, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Go ahead. Thank you very much. So today I will show you some current and future applications of brain-computer interfaces that we are doing. I'm coming from GTEC. Personally, I'm located in Austria. This is where we develop hardware and software, and we're also running research projects over there. And then we have also offices in New York, also here in Barcelona. We have uh, computer scientists programming here, Recoverix, for example. And then we are also in Vancouver, Hong Kong, and in Sapporo. At the moment, we are running about 15 different European Union research projects, and they are all about brain-computer interfacing. And I just pick a few of it in Recoverix lag. We use BCI technology to provide rehabilitation for stroke patients so that they improve in gait. And in Beam Magic, we work with nanoparticles. They are produced in Switzerland. And the idea is to inject the nanoparticles into deep structures of the brain, and then we can activate them with magnetic coals close to the head. And this could be useful for Parkinson's patients. Uh, Brain-computer interfaces are used for many different applications nowadays and also in artistic setups. So here's an example from Dragan Illich. He hooked it up with an industrial robot, fixed many colors, and then visitors of the Ars Electronica Festival could contribute a little piece to the painting. Afterwards, they sold it for 25,000 pounds in London. Uh, very nice artwork. And there's a very nice publication that's comparing different companies, what they are doing in the brain-computer interface domain. And it's very nice that GTEC is leading with 54 different medical applications. Uh, and this just shows for how many different things you can use our technology. And that's also the reason why we have so many happy customers like Airbus, BMW, Dolby around, and of course many universities uh, like Yale and Harvard. Uh, so it's used in many, many countries. I think we are in more than 100 countries where our BCIs are used. So when you are developing a brain-computer interface, you need a subject or a patient. We are recording the EEG on the scalp or the ECOG, the electrocorticogram directly from the cortex. And then we get the control signal to control something in real time. But very important is the feedback loop. So you have to see or you have to feel what you are controlling to get better. And very important is also signal quality. There's a nice publication from Germany that compared different headsets. And with our Nautilus device that Chiara is wearing here, you get, for example, in a 60 minutes recording session, almost no artifacts. And that's key when you're working with patients because you don't want to lose any second of data just because the EEG headset is not good enough. And you can see in the diagram there are other headsets where you lose 53% of the data because it's too bulky, it's too heavy, and that's a big problem, of course. Here's a little video that shows how 
the technology actually works during a backflip. So Martin is demonstrating an eight-channel EEG recording. Uh, you can see here in green color over the brain that all the EEG channels are good. And he's clenching teeth a few times. This is the backyard of our company. Now you can see he jumps. We see an artifact for a few hundred milliseconds and the EEG data is clean again. This is actually what we expect from a good EEG recording system. So it must be perfect. We have also devices that range from eight to 64 channels. And very important is also signal cleaning that you can see here with the OSCA module. So on top you see the raw EEG data, on top on the bottom you see the cleaned EEG. And when Johannes is shaking his hand, you can just see how clean the EEG data comes out. And this saves again a lot of recording time. When you are working with coma patients, this is essential because you really want to keep every single minute or a second. We have also a combination with FNIRS, and then you can do functional near infrared spectroscopy at the same time you are doing EEG data. And I'm coming from this lab from Gerd Fritschler, where I did my PhD thesis, and he came up with the event-related desynchronization, or short ERD. So basically, if you ask a patient to imagine a left-hand movement, then you find an activation contralateral on the right-hand side. You can see here this red spot. This is actually the ERD. And if the person does the opposite, the right-hand movement imagination, you find the activation of the left hemisphere. And very nice is that these spots are on the same location for everybody. And for that reason, we know exactly where we should place the electrodes to pick up motor movements. So it's completely useless to put electrodes on the forehead if you want to decode uh, motor movements. And this is something that we are using nowadays in our medical product, Recoverix. This is for stroke patients. In this case, the patient is wearing the EEG cap with active electrodes. That's very important. So the amplifier is sitting in the electrode to give perfect data quality. Then in front of the patient, we have an avatar, which is, is moving in this case the left hand. This is the instruction for the patient to imagine hand movement. The brain-computer interface picks it up, and then we trigger a functional electrical stimulation of the left hand so that the hand is really moving. And we are repeating this for left and right hand movements, 45 minutes long. And here in the video, you can actually see how this looks like if the real patient is treated. So we have 16 channels over the sensory motor cortex because this is where our source signal is coming from. And now we are stimulating already the left hand. This is in this case the healthy hand, which was not affected by the stroke. So he imagines now the hand movement. The functional electrical stimulator moves the hand. It's randomized. The next one is a right hand movement. He imagines the right hand movement, the stimulator stimulates, the hand moves. You could also see the spasticity in the index finger, so he couldn't fully uh, move it. And this continues for 45 minutes and patients are coming back for 25 treatment sessions and we are getting highly significant improvements almost for everybody when we are doing that. And I'll show you one example of a very young lady who had a stroke when she was 38 years old. 14 months after this stroke, she came into our own rehabilitation center that we are running, and the stroke affected her right hand side. Then you can see we did 20 or 31 training sessions with her. In the first session, she reached 65% accuracy. This means our brain computer interface can separate the EEG data from left versus right hand movement with 65%. So 50% would be random. If you're just sitting there and you're not participating, it's 50. It would always pick left or right. So we want to have the accuracy as big as possible, and you can see with every single run, the accuracy increased. Here, she reached even 100%. And this is a very important coaching parameter for the therapist. So if they don't reach high accuracies, then you can kick them a little bit to do better, because we know from our clinical study, if your accuracy is below 80%, then you are less improving compared to patients who are above 80%. And this leads to a lot of motivation for the stroke patients. And here in the middle, we can see session one. The red vertical line shows the time point when the patient gets the instruction. And then we can see that we can separate left and right hand movement, but it takes the sensory motor cortex for about three seconds to activate. On the bottom, we see, well, let's do this first. So in session 31, you can see the sensory motor cortex is switched on immediately within 200 milliseconds, and the difference is much bigger. This is exactly what we want to achieve. And on the bottom, we see the event-related desynchronization maps. This is session one, session 32. This is the healthy side. 
This is the paretic side damaged by this stroke. So we actually want to see as much red color here in the alpha and beta region of the EEG. And you can see here is a lot of white color because of the stroke. But in session 31, we see a lot of ERD, and this is exactly the brain plasticity that we are producing with recoveries. These are the biomarkers that we extract from the EEG, but we do 18 different clinical assessments. And one of these tests is the upper extremity Fugelmeier. So blue is before, she had about 56 points, afterwards she had 62 points, a nice improvement, but it's much nicer to see the improvements in the nine-hole pack test. So in this case, she has to put nine little sticks into certain locations with the healthy hand, which is the left, and she improved from 17 seconds to 14, improvement of 16%. This is also what we see all the time, an improvement of the healthy side, which is also very useful for the stroke patient. But of course, much more interesting is the right paretic side. So at the beginning, she needed seven minutes and 26 seconds. At the end, she could do it in one minute and 14 seconds. Improvement of more than 600% in fine motoric skills. And this makes a huge difference for a patient. You can also see that spasticity was, for example, reduced, measured with the Ashward scale. And here's actually a video of the nine-hole pack test that she did after the therapy. And you can see how complicated it is for somebody who was paralyzed. So you have to get the sticks between your fingers, then you have to rotate your hand, you have to put it into hand, into the hole. So altogether very complicated, and this is how it looks like for somebody who needs one minute and 14 seconds. So healthy people need about 20 to 30 seconds. This is actually the haircut that she was giving after the recovery therapy to our physiotherapist. Look at the right hand, that's the paretic one. So she can now use both hands again. And this was the reason why she could open her hairdressing institute again after the recovery therapy. Beforehand, the social security system was paying her salary. And this was actually her life expectations. And when I go back to the nine-hole pack test, you can see how quick it was. Basically, she trained for five sessions to get her fine motoric skills back. And this means 3.5 hours of training. It's like nothing. This is running very successful, and up to now we did already 30,000 treatments just in my company in Schiedelberg, where I'm located. Now we are getting more invasive. Here's a slide from Kai Miller, who is a neurosurgeon at Mayo Clinic, and he implanted so-called ECOG electrodes. They are made of platinum. And you can see here these little white and black circles. Each circle is one electrode. And actually, the patient gets 64 wires coming out of the scalp, and it's connected to the brain-computer interface. Then Kai was asking uh, the patient to be at rest. He calculated the power spectrum that you can see here in blue color, and you can see the characteristic 1 over F damping of the EEG. So with higher uh, frequency, there is less energy. Then he was asking the patient to do a hand movement, calculated the power spectrum again, and if, and if we compare it in the low frequency band, then we see during rest we have more energy than doing the hand movement. This is the event-related desynchronization that we know already from recoveries, and you can see a very wide cortical network is involved for producing this activity. That's the reason why we can also measure it with EEG sensors on the head. But if we go to the high frequency band, in this case between 80 and 100 hertz, then we see exactly the opposite. So during resting, we have less energy than doing the hand movement. This is called task-related high gamma activity. And it's very nice because more or less one single electrode is coding this information. And this gives us a lot of spatial resolution, which is also demonstrated by the slide here. In this case, the epilepsy patient had a data graph. Then we asked him to move five times the dump, be at rest, move four times again, move seven times the index finger, be at rest, and move a couple of times the pinky finger. Then we reconstructed with one single electrode the dump movements. We took the dark blue electrode from here, decoded it with the brain-computer interface, and in purple you can actually see the reconstructed signal. And here you can see that we can see how many times the patient is moving the finger. This is very nice. And very interesting is this large overshot at the beginning. So when the patient is doing a task the first time, then your brain is producing a lot of high gamma activation. And with every single repetition, it gets smaller and smaller because the, you don't need the cortex anymore, the spinal cord takes over. 
And this means we have to interleave tasks to produce all the time high gamma activation. Here you can see the same for the index finger, large overshot, and then it gets smaller and smaller with every single repetition. And the same for the little finger. And in this case, we can decode different fingers from each other with very high resolution. And this is something that we use also in another medical product, which is called Cortex U. And this is used by neurosurgeons or neurologists in the operating room or intensive care unit. And in this case, we are implanting 256 ECOG channels over the most important centers that we want to investigate. On the left-hand side, you can actually see how the ECOG signal looks like. And then we have a computer screen in front of the patient. So a patient is just doing what the computer screen is telling him. At the moment, relaxing, just sitting there, and we are recording baseline high gamma. Now he is sticking in and out the tongue. So first of all, we get an activation of the face-sensitive region on the temporal base because he is seeing the face. And afterwards, we get an activation of the tongue region. So the sensory motor cortex responsible for tongue movement. Then we ask him again to relax so that we get additional baseline high gamma activation to be more reliable. This takes 15 seconds. And then he's listening to the story. So he's just listening. First of all, we see an activation of the symbol region on the temporal base because he's seeing the loudspeaker. And a few moments later, we have auditory cortex and Wernicke's area because he is understanding what the computer is reading. Then he's relaxing again. And the last task is to solve Rubik's Cube. So we see again a temporal base activation of the shape region and the color region. And a few moments later, we find the finger region. This is actually the information that the neurosurgeon no needs for the surgery. So if he would remove, for example, the brain tissue below this red bubble here, this would have the consequence that the patient cannot move the fingers anymore. And this BCI research is also very important for neurosurgeons. For example, the face region located here was resected a few years ago because they just believed it has no function. And when you remove the face region, then you cannot recognize other people anymore. And this is something that came out of BCI research. And there's another very nice example how you can use ECOG data for BCI experiments. In this case, the epilepsy patient is just looking at the different images and we are decoding in real time what he is seeing. So this is a symbol, this is a face. You can see we can do it faster than the patient is actually realizing what he's seeing. Another face, another symbol. Now, this is very interesting. He sees himself, it's a face. This is one of our PhDs, Christoph Capelle, it's a face. And this is what I explained before. He is already used to Dr. Ogawa's face, and for that reason, we don't have high gamma activation. So he has to prompt him first to activate the cortex again. And up to now, we can decode 18 different types of symbols. And if somebody is watching a video, we can see in real time what the person is seeing at the moment. Um, and now I'm getting non-invasive again. So for communication with brain-computer interfaces, uh, for locked-in patients, people are using very often P300 responses. And on top here, you can actually see a standard visual evoke potential. When you are looking, for example, at the one hertz flashing item on a computer screen. So there are different waves, they have different names, like N100, it's negative, and 100 milliseconds after the stimulus. And for brain-computer interface communication, we have to add a cognitive task. So I could ask you, for example, to count as quick as possible how many times the P is flashing. And then we are showing all the other characters, and as soon as the target character appears, now you are experiencing a P300 response in your brain. And this P300 wave is just overlaying a standard visually evoked potential. And Mani Donchin from Florida developed this spelling matrix with different characters and numbers. And when we are highlighting different characters, and the target character appears, then your brain responds with the green line. So this is how a P300 response looks like. It's about 220 milliseconds after the time point when the W appeared, so it's around 300 milliseconds, and the amplitude is about seven microvolts, so it's pretty small. And for all the other characters, you get as a response the orange line. The brain-computer interface basically has to find the difference.
And of course, a patient wants to spell as quick as possible. So a very easy trick is to highlight all and rows and columns at the same time. Then you can communicate six times faster. And when we are applying a nice trick, so when we overlay the black and white characters with famous faces, like Russell Crowe, then your brain tries to identify the face. And this is producing actually a much bigger P300 response. And that's the reason why we always achieve 100% accuracy with this setup, and this works just very nice. And here's another concept. Uh, this is actually 15 years after the, we developed the P300 response. Uh, and this is based on code-based visual evoke potentials. So here's Bernard. He wears our unicorn hybrid black, so we have eight electrodes over the most important regions for identifying uh, C-webs. Then we need 30 seconds for the calibration of the brain-computer interface. So the person is just sitting in front of the computer screen looking at this item, which will start to flash in a few moments. He's just looking there. This gives us 30 seconds of EEG data just good enough for calibrating the brain-computer interface with high accuracy and to reach a robust control. On top, you can see also in green the data quality of the EG electrodes. So during the calibration, it's important that you're not speaking. You should not have a chewing gum. We want to have clean data uh, for the calibration. Afterwards, it's not so important anymore. Then Bernard can actually select in real time one of the 30 items, so they are all on the computer screen, and if he looks at one of the items, then you can see a little red dot, which appears a few moments later, and the item is selected. So maybe it's a little bit small on the beamer, but I can guide it you. He's looking now here, selected, now here, selected, now here, selected. And so we don't get any false positives, and you can also see how quick, we can actually do that. Here the red dot is a little bit bigger. Select it, this one, select it, and the last one, select it. So this works after 30 seconds of training without mistakes. If the person looks to other things, it doesn't select anything. And this is something that we are using very nicely also in computer games nowadays. And here's another example of the P300 response. This is politically incorrect called Blondie check. So in this case, we are showing different images. And the person is just looking at the images for 100 milliseconds. And with BCI technology, we can make a ranking of the most important images for your brain. So I can start the video that you get an impression how this actually looks in real time. So the person is just observing. We collect EEG data, we classify it. Then we have a ranking and you can see the blonde girl is positioned on the most important uh, position for this male participant. And for example, the landscape is the least important image for the person. And we tested it first with male students and suddenly always the blonde girls appeared on first position and this is why we called it Blondie Check. This is of course a funny application, but you can also use it for serious applications. Uh, like logos in neuromarketing, so you can present Airbus and Boeing, select different logos, you can also present food, uh, paella and McDonald's. And uh, we used it also at Ars Electronica Festival uh, with a lady from Argentina. Uh, so we had many different images and suddenly six men with a long beard were ranking first and her husband were, was standing behind her he didn't have a beard, so sometimes you also want to hide what the blondie check actually extracts. Um, but this, this is a pretty funny application, but we have also a medical application using the P300 response. And this is what we use for coma patients. So if you look at this diagram, then we find here normal people, and they have normal motor responses and of course normal cognitive function. But coma patients don't move, and the EEG is pretty flat, so there's no information inside. But some patients in the vegetative state or minimal consciousness state, they are just a little bit better, they don't move, but they might have some cognitive functions. Sometimes it's also the case for locked-in patients or completely locked-in patients, we just don't know it. And that's the reason why we developed the Mind Beagle system. This is our brain-computer interface for testing command following. The Beagle is the little dog that you might know from Australia on the airport, they have a very good nose, 
they sniff in your luggage if you're bringing anything illegal. In our case, it's sniffing inside the brain if there are cognitive functions left. This is how it looks like. So these coma patients are normally lying. We put on the EEG cap. In the back, we have the brain-computer interface, and the physician or the therapist can run the assessment uh, patterns. And then we do an auditory testing first. So we have six different tests, but I explain only one here. In this case, we have in-ear phones, and the patient is instructed, please count only the high tones. And then we are playing a sequence like da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da. Whenever the patient counts correctly the high tone, then we find the P300 response again, indicated here in green. And the blue line is the standard auditory response for the low tones. And in this case, it's very easy to see that there's a huge difference between high and low tones, um, which is not common in patients. Very often, these evoke potentials are pretty ugly, and nobody knows how to interpret it. And that's the reason why we need, a, again, the brain-computer interface classification accuracy plotted here. So all together, we are applying 30 high tones. And this patient needed only to hear four high tones to reach 100% accuracy. And this means we can perfectly discriminate EEG data from high tones versus EEG data from low tones. And this means the patient's brain is able to do that task. And this is actually what we want to figure out. And on the other hand side, if the accuracy is 0%, it means there's no information at all in the data. On this day, either the patient is sleeping or it's, the brain is just not working as expected. And if this was tested successful, we can go one step ahead and we can ask him yes and no questions. And when he is counting little vibrations that we apply on the left hand side, then it's producing a P300 response on the left hand side. This is what the brain-computer interface can detect. And then if the patient counts the vibrations that we apply on the right-hand side, he can actually say no. And then we ask something like, do you like Barcelona? Then the brain-computer interface collects 30 seconds of data. And this is the magic moment when the little loop moves to the yes. And this confirms the answer. And here I have an example from a patient in Sicily, in Palermo. Uh, so that you can see how this actually works in real time. In this case, the caregiver is asking, am I speaking in Italian, in Italian language? So the expected answer is actually a yes. So I started. In Italiano, per si conti a sinistra, per no conti a destra, okay? So this was the instruction and the question for the patient. Now he clicks on the button on the mind visual system. Now the vibrations are applied on the left-hand side, right-hand side. The patient starts to count the little vibrations for the left-hand side because the caregiver was speaking in Italian language. This takes 30 seconds. And then the little loop should move to the desired location. So if the brain-computer interface is not sure about the answer, the loop stays in the middle. And only if it's statistically significant, it goes to the yes or to the no. Uh, this is always the magic moment. Brava! Perfetto, Valentin! And when we are asking 10 questions where we know the answer, and the patient can answer most of the questions correctly, we get the very objective proof that patients have common following. And this is a game changer for these patients because families have no idea, you know, they're in this coma state for many years. You don't get any feedback and suddenly the loop moves. Patient, uh, families are happy. And also it's important for physicians because they can understand if patients are understanding anything. And this is just changing everything. It just takes 30 seconds to prove it. And of course, you should also ask exactly the opposite so if some questions are confirmed with a yes, you should also ask the opposite with no, just to test if this is really common following. And then it's very objective what you can get out, and you cannot fake it. Um, the last principle that I would like to explain are steady state visual evoke potentials, which are used in brain-computer interfacing. In this case, you have to turn up the flickering frequency of a LED to something above 6 hertz. So in this case, we use 7 hertz. And if we calculate the power spectrum of the EEG, then we find the peak at 7 hertz at 14 and 21 hertz. It's also the first and second harmonic component. 
And this is something that we used in a telepresence application. So in this case, the patient was seated in front of a computer screen. He could see a robot forward, backward, left, and right. Here you can see a standard steady state visually evoked potential stimulation. So we switch on and off the stimulation, for example, with 10 hertz, it's constant. But if we are embedding a code, like we switch on the LED for a certain time and off for a certain time, then you will find exactly the same code in the EEG. And with template matching algorithm, we are able to identify the code. And very nice is the grand average accuracy that we can achieve with code-based visually evoked potentials. So we reached 98% accuracy in this control task. And even if you are steering this little robot with a joystick, it will not be 100%. So the accuracy and robustness of the principle is just very high. And I just recorded a funny video to show you what this we are doing first. nowadays with this technology. So this again are unicorn hybrid black with electrodes over the most important brain centers for decoding this. And I can actually steer along this little avatar, but this is done with the keyboard because the keyboard has a very high information transfer rate. So it doesn't make any sense to replace it with a PCI control. But we embedded some things into the game that you can only do with the brain computer interface and not with the keyboard. So I can mentally destroy these boxes that you can see here. And when I destroy a box, then this, the little bridge closes. So I'm, I'm now using the keyboard again to follow the path. Then there's one of the enemies, so I have to avoid it. Of course, I'm not allowed to fall down. And now I can just destroy with the brain computer interface this little cube. It takes a few moments, it's exploding, and then I'm able to collect the coin. And when I collect the coin, the bridge is closing behind me, so this guy, and I can actually continue in the game. So in this case, I'm combining keyboard or joystick control with some things that I can only solve with the brain-computer interface, and suddenly it becomes very useful and it's a lot of fun. And this is also what we use in our hackathons that we are organizing worldwide. So they uh, had also hidden doors that were only opened with the brain-computer interface. This is also very useful for patients, for example, for entertainment, because then they can really play something. The last topic that I want to mention is our Bangulin system. So this is a 1024 channel high density EEG system inspired by the animal here. Some people were saying this guy is responsible for COVID, um, but all the, the different scales inspired us actually to develop a certain EEG electrode, which has much more channels. And if we look at this diagram here, then we have here the skin and the scalp. And here we have the cortex. And it's pretty fascinating that the distance from the cortex to the skin is between 15 and 25 millimeters. So this means our brains are actually pretty small if we subtract that. But you can also see if we are overlaying, for example, 256 EEG electrodes, then we have a distance of about two centimeters between the electrodes. And this is also important because if you bring the electrodes too close to each other, you get bridging and shortcuts and we would only record nonsense. And that's the reason why we developed these Bangulin scales. So each electrode grid has 16 golden electrodes. They are glued onto the shaved head with this washer here. It's filled with electrode shale. And here's a head stage amplifier, so it's very important that the amplifier is as close as possible to the EEG electrode to get high quality recordings. And this is actually how it looks like on a, a patient with 1024 channels overlaying the whole cortex. And this is a comparison for a finger movement task. So I showed you beforehand the epilepsy patient who moved the thumb and the index finger. And to distinguish different fingers from each other was up to now only possible with ECOG data. But with the Bangolin system, you can see that we can get very nice spatial resolution for different fingers. So here's the thumb, the index finger. So they are very nicely distributed. And if we map it, onto this uh, scheme here, then you see these uh, little rings. So each little ring is a Bangolin electrode. We have 1,024 channels. And you can see here how the fingers are coded. And in dark gray, you can see the standard 1020 system which is used in hospitals. This means one single electrode located here would be responsible to register all the information from different fingers. 
you can see it's just impossible because the information, the spatial resolution is just not good enough. And in our case, we have many, many electrodes overlaying this region. And with this slide, I would actually end my presentation. Thanks for the reminder. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. This was uh, impressive, amazing. Uh, thank you for adjusting to the time, too, Christoph. So we have some time now for discussion. Do you have uh, any questions? Then I, I can start with a question. For the studies that you presented with uh, patients with uh, altered consciousness states, have you, do you know if the, the response, the capacity that it responds, as you show, either responding yes or no with your system, does so have some predictive value in the sense that they will eventually recover from the state or not? Yes, the, that's very interesting. So we calculate the brain-computer interface classification accuracy, and we know if the accuracy is equal or above 45%, and this is a positive predictor for the patient to get better in coma recovery scale, revised. So either they just improve in scale or they even wake up. Yeah, but and actually it, it shows that the brain is, is, is like a test showing that the brain is perhaps better. No? I mean, if it can, she can respond like this or, yeah. Definitely, and it's, you know, it, it's always fitting. So if the accuracy is equal or above 45%, these patients are better half a year later. Okay. So we never had an outlier, it always predicts well. Any other question? Yeah, there's one question. Hi, uh, my name is Wei Mion from um, Taiwan. Yeah. I have a question about uh, your high-dense EEG, EEG um, electrode systems. And I'm wondering, the, the beauty of the EEG, I think it can emulate for the need for the implantable leads, I think, the cortical leads. So uh, for a patient like, uh, for a patient have to do the brain mapping like epilepsy surgery, patient taking the ability surgery, they have to do the code to, to do the brain mapping with the implantable electrodes. So if we can use the high density EEG to replace that, uh, could you recommend for the like uh, 124 electrodes compared can equivalent to how many channel for the ECOG systems? That's depending why you would need the ECOG. So if there's a brain tumor, and then you have to open the, the scalp anyhow to do the surgery. But we can uh, test with the Bangulin system many other things, for example, high-frequency oscillations. These are these little ripples that uh, identify the epileptic zones, and that's uh, the seizure onset zone. And so we can also identify spikes combined at the same time point with ripples. This is something that we are doing in a research project with a couple of European partners with the Bangulin system. So the idea would be to identify within maybe 10 minutes these ripples, and then you don't have to keep these patients for two weeks in the intensive care unit with the implant. Um, so the idea would be to do a 10 minutes pangolin session. Of course, you have to shave the epilepsy patient, but it's still much better than implanting ECOG electrodes. And then they can, could go directly to the operating room. And then you could quickly uh, within a few minutes, verify the results. When the scalp is open, you can do the resection much quicker. So this would be a use case which would be very nice. Also for the patient, if he doesn't have to stay for two weeks in the hospital. I think most of the time for the, for the brain mapping, they have to use like uh, 64 channels, ECOG system. So if you can do the high density EEG to replace that procedure, I think it would be a great benefit to do that. Yeah, we, we can of course do it on the whole head because you, you can just shave the whole head, it doesn't matter. Um, and the ECOG electrodes are very complicated on some locations. So you have to remove the dura mater from the scalp to, to insert the, the ECOG grids. And this is also risky. Um, so if we can avoid that, that, this would be a big advantage, of course. Thank you. Okay, we have one question online, and, and we'll be the last one because we're a bit tight of time. So, Omer Karamelden asks, my question from last game, does the using keyboard interfere with P300 signal? I mean the motor signal. I guess the question, yeah, is if the, using the keyboard 
really know the issue. Ah, okay. Uh, so this was the little game where I was controlling the avatar. We used the keyboard and also the C-Web. So the C-Webs are extracted from the visual cortex because uh, there we get the biggest response. The motor cortex is of course activated when they are moving the fingers. Um, but the code that we embed with the C-Web into the EEG is much stronger than other thoughts or memories that the person is doing, so it's not interfering at all. So you can also have conversations at the same time, you can listen, it doesn't interfere because it's so stable. Okay, so thank you very much, Christoph. Thanks a lot for this amazing presentation. So I'm really pleased now to introduce our second speaker, uh, Dr. Eduard Vieta. Uh, he's a very well-known person by all of us here at the, at the faculty, I think, and the hospital. He's a full professor in psychiatry at the Department of Medicine of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at the University of Barcelona. He's also the, the head of the psychiatry and psychology service at the hospital clinic and the scientific uh, director of the CIBER-SAM, which is the Spanish research network for mental health. He has received uh, numerous international awards. It's impossible to mention all of them, including a Dr. Honoris Causa by the University of Valencia. He's the uh, world's most cited author in psychiatry. He has published over 1,000 uh, original articles in the field, uh, published over 50 books in the field, in particular in bipolar disorders. And, uh, and um, we are really happy um, to have him here and welcome. Very, thank you very much, Eduard. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, so I think the, the motto of this meeting is actually uh, the healthy pathological and uh, the uh, artificial brain. And I'm going to argue that we all have a potentially healthy, potentially pathological, and I'm quite sure that we all have an artificial brain as well with us because this is an artificial brain. And is anybody here who doesn't have a smartphone? Oh, right? Everybody has a smartphone. So, uh, of course, this is sort of a hypothesis for our, uh, our brain, and it's very helpful. Uh, the easiest example is when you are uh, having dinner with some friends, and you want to speak about a, a movie or a film, and you don't remember the name of the actor or the actress. And in the past, we, I remember I was stuck trying to remember, and then I was missing part of the conversation because at some point I got stuck with being unable to remember the name of the person that I wanted to mention. And now it's so easy, right? So uh, certainly uh, the uh, use of uh, mHealth has been a sort of a revolution, is being a sort of a revolution, and this is what I'm going to talk a little bit on digital innovation as applied to mental health, but particularly uh, on mHealth. These are my conflicts uh, of interest. So, uh, in general, in psychiatry and in uh, psychology as well, the main, the main problem that we have in terms of doing scientific assessment is that there are a lot of uh, potential sources of bias because all our endpoints are soft. They are based on interviews, they are based on scales, they are based on things that need to be assessed in a way which is a bit subjective. Um, the reality sometimes can be quite different from what we capture from those tools. The other problem is also that we are still a bit uh, far from what is now the revolution of precision medicine. We, are not, we haven't got there yet, so most of our interventions, including psychiatric, uh, pharmacological, psychological interventions, are sort of one size fits all. We just provide a menu of solutions and we uh, do some trial and error to try to uh, find a solution to the patient or the person who is asking for help. So this is why the concept of precision psychiatry is so important, because we're trying to uh, converge into trying to be uh, better at predicting response, better at using the tools that we have, and better at getting more objective endpoints in the way that we assess the interventions that we use, uh, for example, to treat patients. So the, all the area of digital psychiatry includes a number of uh, 
fields, including mHealth, e-mental e health, telepsychiatry. This has been particularly helpful during the pandemic. Uh, for example, here in my hospital, uh, we uh, managed uh, very quickly to provide uh, cameras uh, and, and, and links and, uh, I mean, and, and software for all the doctors to be able to connect uh, with patients by telepsychiatry. The main difficulty was that uh, many of our patients didn't have the, the knowledge, especially all these people, uh, to use the tools. But uh, in fact, the area where we work here in the Champla, in this area of Barcelona, uh, the cultural level is relatively high, so we could still manage with telepsychiatry, something that is now fashionable because in Madrid they're trying to do it without any infrastructure and there is a lot of uh, discussion about this. So there is all the field of digital psychiatry that includes uh, the capture of big data, for example, and thick data for single patients, machine learning, digital phenotyping, and artificial intelligence that is providing new tools, new systems, uh, new strategies to uh, assess, to monitor our patients and to predict response, for example. So we were using uh, digital psychiatry includes uh, real-time video consultations. This is what we did for clinical care during the pandemic. We still do it in some cases. For chronic patients, it may work. It's not useful for new patients. This is why this uh, controversy in Madrid doesn't make much sense because it doesn't make sense to do telepsychiatry for patients who you never saw before, right? Um, and obviously, the most important application is the use of the smartphones because everybody has a smartphone and wearables. So uh, with these tools, we can actually use, for example, sensors that capture, we, we, we saw in the previous talk, uh, sophisticated uh, tool of sensors, but you can have more simpler, but also uh, sensors that can be uh, even already in our smartphone. There are plenty of things that can be captured with a smartphone, or you can combine with a wearable, and then you get many more information. And then you can use its patterns, uh, you have permanent connection, you have high density data, because you have, you can capture the main barrier, of course, is the ethical issues and the data protection issues, which is another matter we can discuss later. But clearly, otherwise, this tool is actually telling a lot about us. And you, as you know, for example, uh, the use now of uh, Google, for example, can tell you when the, a flu is coming, the new flu, because uh, just by capturing the words uh, cough, fever, or headache, uh, and the pattern of distribution, the, 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 the frequency of these words, when you Google them, when you use it in an email, they can predict when the flu is coming over the world, right? There are plenty of potential uses, and of course, good use, but also wrong use. And from this, you also do digital phenotyping and tailored interventions. And some of the things that you can capture include, include the actigraphy, where you can capture uh, uh, the activity and also uh, you can also include uh, uh, sleep patterns. You can uh, get, of course, the smartphone usage, even analysis of uh, words, conversations. Of course, this is a bit sensitive in terms of data protection. Uh, the, the, the dermic uh, activity uh, of the skin, voice and language, etc. For example, an application of this is uh, this is a project that we have conducted called Simple. This is an application for patients with bipolar disorder when uh, the, the smartphone is capturing the data that the patient is introducing on an everyday basis, if they want, they can provide their own subjective perception of how the mood is, how well they slept, uh, whether they are irritable, but it also captures uh, passive data, metadata from activity uh, and, and other things. And then you can actually, uh, there is a correlation between what you would measure as the uh, severity of manic symptoms and severity of depressive symptoms by a correlation with these particular patterns of uh, usage and passive data captured by the smartphone. And we did a feasibility study to see uh, whether this would be uh, useful for patients, and what we saw it is that it is useful, but, the other, but there is also a problem that people get bored of introducing data. So at some point, uh, introducing uh, the, your, how you feel, etc. After a couple of months, people are start to be tired. So probably the passive data is more useful because the compliance is not uh, a barrier. Of course, the advantage of uh, telepsychiatry, mHealth, and smartphones is that 
uh, even though you pay some money for the smartphone, then you use it a lot. So it's actually, it, it's a good investment for you. And at the end, for the use in, in mental health, it is very cost effective. If you use it right, you, it really get, gives you a lot of information that otherwise you would have to capture by interviews, paying uh, uh, people to do the interviews and, and other more expensive measures. However, when you look at apps, I, I showed an example of the app that we developed, but this is an app that was developed uh, really not exactly to make money, but to just to serve the patients. But there are plenty of apps uh, around there. And many of them have never, the majority have never been tested for validity and reliability. So it's very, it's a field that uh, lacks a lot of science. Everyone can develop a, a, a small app and say that it, it works for you if you have bipolar, you have depression, you have schizophrenia for whatever reasons. So there's plenty of this and practically uh, only 2% uh, of these apps have been tested in clinical trials. So the majority have never been tested. There have been attempts to prove that they improve some symptoms and in this case, in the slide, you see the improvement of depressive symptoms. And I think that there is room for these apps to help you uh, to improve depression if the patient has a form of depression which is relatively mild, mild to moderate. Sometimes there are applications, there is one, for example, that is uh, tested in an RCT, which is called the Prexis, for example, and you can get it. And it's an app that asks you questions and then gives you, in return, some advice. It is personalized advice, according to things that you answered initially and some questions, and then, depending on how you feel, it gives you some reasonable advice. It's not very smart, to be honest, but it's something that, for some people, it actually works. It helps people to, to get better, better humor, to be, but it has to be in people who are very mildly depressed. So there is some effect in this meta-analysis. You can see here a lot of uh, studies. Uh, uh, but for example, if you try in patients with bipolar disorder, the efficacy is much lower because this is a more severe condition and you cannot treat, for example, mania with, with an app. This is uh, clearly not the case. So this is why it is particularly useful to have uh, activity and wearables in mood disorders and in many psychiatric conditions. Um, what is important also, of course, there are many types of wearables and there are wearables that are more focused uh, or more designed for research and they capture more quality and more things. Uh, but it is also important that a wearable uh, does not stigmatize because if you wear a wearable that it looks very weird, people may ask, why are you wearing, why are you wearing this? Uh, and, and patients don't want to wear something that looks like uh, I'm a patient, uh, I have a psychiatric condition. So it is important also to, to try to find a wearable that is uh, sort of uh, fancy but not stigmatizing. Um, so at the end, I think uh, one of the things that we uh, managed to uh, find out was that one of the most powerful uh, tools to uh, monitor bipolar disorder outcome was uh, actigraphy and was uh, activation in particular. And you can actually measure activation, which is very sensitive to detect changes in the mood of the patients. So this is an objective measure and an objective way to monitor patients. You don't need to call them every day. You just capture the data from the phone and, and they are able to uh, get the feedback from the uh, application themselves. Another project that we are working on is this called Intrepid, which tries to identify digital biomarkers of illness activity and treatment response, again, in bipolar disorder, which is our uh, main area of research. And again, we, we, we are using a novel wearable device to try to separate and to try to apply the paradigm of uh, precision psychiatry by using uh, these uh, activation measures. And these are examples of what we can get, for, for example, the uh, the skin response, uh, there's a lot of uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic measures uh, and neurophysiological measures that you can capture with a wearable, which are uh, relatively simple but quite sensitive to changes in the behavior. And, and I think the, the beauty of this is that you can capture behavioral changes without having to ask the patient or having to interpret by yourself what the patient is doing. It's already the sensors that give you uh, a pattern that you can follow up and it's high density information that you can uh, use to monitor the patient. 
Of course, there are challenges and barriers. There is skepticism uh, on long-term engagement. I already mentioned there are dropouts, there is attrition. Uh, people get bored sometimes of this uh, or don't want to participate anymore. And there are also the ethical, legal, and data protection issues that, as mentioned, are important. It is important to preserve uh, uh, the privacy of the patients, even though, to be honest, if we think of it, all of us tend to, uh, when we want to Google, you have to accept the terms by Google, and these are 60 pages. Has anyone here read the 60 pages of the Google disclaimer before accepting? Nobody, right? So we all agreed to share our data uh, in a very, you know, uh, naive way. And then for uh, research matters, uh, all the ethic committees are very pushy, so it's, uh, sometimes it's a bit funny. Uh, so in conclusion, I think digital psychiatry is a new avenue for precision psychiatry. Of course, precision psychiatry includes a lot of other things that I didn't have time to mention, like uh, genetic markers, like uh, peripheral biomarkers, like neuroimaging. There are many, many other ways to try to improve our ability to make a, a better, better phenotyping, to do a better diagnosis, an earlier diagnosis, and to improve our ability to monitor and treat our patients early and effectively. But I think uh, with digital tools, we are getting closer to that concept. Uh, and the, the, the availability of the smartphone, the wearables, and all these applications that are coming up uh, makes it very pragmatic, very ecological, and very useful to be combined at the end with the other biomarkers that I mentioned. So I think in the near future, we will see that psychiatry and even clinical psychology will get into this paradigm of more precision, more use of objective tools, and being more effective in terms of not having such a variability in the way that we diagnose or we treat our patients. It's going to be more scientific, I think, in the near future, and this is going to be the artificial brain that is going to help us in that aim. So, of course, this may bring problems in terms of you know, privacy, as we said, and technology. And you see here that the patient is a bit worried by, by healthcare being impersonal, but you know, we can use technology. I hope that we can use this technology in a wise way. Thank you very much for your attention. And thanks to Diego, Diego Hidalgo and, and, and Gerard Amella, who are the, the people in my group who are the best in, in this area of digital psychiatry. Thank you very much, Eduard. So just, can you hold for perhaps some five minutes? Thank you very much for this very inspiring <laughs> talk. I really found it very interesting. Thanks so much. So is there any question in the room? Uh, Jordi has one. Thank you, very nice talk. And do you think that these tools are more useful for mood disorders or you can use it, or there are any special psychiatric uh, patients that could be more useful? Because I think that you need a very close collaboration with the patients. Yeah, I think the, the, the best, of course these tools can be used across all conditions, but the best use is in conditions where there is more behavioral change. Because what you really capture objectively is behavioral change. So any conditions like, for example, uh, of course bipolar is one of the best examples, but for example a phobia, in a phobia you would also be a lot of changes in the body at the time that the person is exposed and you could do some sort of uh, neurofeedback or biofeedback uh, by using that. So it's, there are conditions where uh, the behavioral change is connected to a certain stimuli or because of spontaneous changes that are useful, uh, but there are conditions where it is much more difficult. If you would have somebody who has some sort of uh, depressive symptoms uh, linked to um, failure in their marriage, uh, this is a bit more difficult to capture with the smartphone because you know, there's no such behavior. I mean, there's more sort of feelings, things like this. So it really depends a lot on uh, the amount of behavioral uh, symptoms that are associated to the condition that you want to monitor or you want to treat with this. Yeah, and schizophrenia could be good patients also? Yeah, in schizophrenia, um, one thing that is, uh, of course, you could also monitor behavior because patients, when, get, when they start to get sick, they start to sleep less. You could capture, for example, for early intervention, right? Because these patients do not have a very good insight in general, with exceptions, and it would be a way to capture a relapse very early if the sleep is disturbed at some point, for example, or more activity or other things. But there is also another potential indication about, for example, hallucinations that would be interesting. I think it's an area of very active area of research 
to try to find whether you can actually capture hallucinations by changes in some of the sensors or some of the, uh, and things like this, you could help, then they could help to, for example, track treatment response. If you want to reduce hallucinations, you could see whether there is a correlation with certain biobehavioral measures and see whether a treatment is reducing the density of those behaviors, etc. Hi, thank you for this interesting talk. Um, I have a question which is, um, you mentioned that this app um, have like a 50% of dropout, and usually these people that drop out are the ones that are more severe or are more interesting for the different projects. So my question was, how are you managing this 50% dropout in the research projects? Yes, we tried uh, many things, and some of them are more successful than others. For example, one, one way is gamification. You try to improve your app by including some incentives, some games, making it more attractive, making, instead of asking how you feel today, uh, making sort of a little game that you can, uh, and there are ways to, to improve the friendliness and the attraction of, of the application. Uh, then the other thing, of course, is to, um, I, I don't think you can use the app alone. You have to see the patient relatively frequently to incentivize the use of the app, uh, showing them. And one thing that we do with our app is that the patients, if they want, some, some they, don't, they don't do it, but they can get feedback on uh, their own uh, course of illness. Uh, and, and they get also feedback, for example, with, with Simple, they get feedback on psychoeducation. They, they get some advice on what to do, what not to do in a friendly way. Uh, and this is, uh, has improved uh, the, the compliance because the patients then feel that it's a bit more personalized. It's not just throwing data, data or show, sharing data with us. They also get some sort of feedback. So there are ways to try to improve this. Of course, this is uh, expensive. Uh, you need grants. You need to invest money. But there are ways to do it. There was one last question there. Yeah, go ahead. Just yeah. a small follow-up, just a second. Yeah. So at the oh, moment, sorry. we would be on the um, using the phone to do this follow-up, but not suppressing the presential follow-ups in the projects, right? Exactly. I think it is critical that this is not replacing uh, the follow-up in person. Yeah. Hi. Um, so thank you for your talk. I learned a lot. Uh, I'd like to ask a question that is more out of curiosity, and is uh, before you mentioned that one of the variables that can be monitored is usage, usage time, right, of uh, smartphones. So I was wondering whether there's evidence on the association of, for example, uh, us usage time of uh, social media apps or the content that you might be consuming on social media and the onset or course of affective episodes, for example. Well, in bipolar disorder, this is an extremely sensitive measure. Uh, but of course, the, it, it, it is sensitive also in terms of ethical and data protection, but it is very, there is a, a great correlation between, for example, social media activity and hypomanic episodes. In, in bipolar patients, maybe there are people here who are not psychiatrists, uh, the patients have ups and downs, and when they are up, they start to be very active socially and outgoing, uh, and then sometimes they, they lose a lot of the inhibitions that we all have. Well, not everybody has on Twitter, on, on, on social media. And then they can become, uh, sometimes some patients become sort of haters for some time, and then they, when they get depressed, they, they regret everything they said, but uh, that's also the nature of Twitter a little bit. But the activity in social media is a very good correlate of behavioral change in everybody. But of course, in bipolar disorder, because this is a sort of exaggeration of what happens to all of us, that we have ups and downs, a little mood swings, uh, it is very, very powerful, actually. OK, thank you. OK, fantastic. So thank you very much. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks a lot. So now, is, uh, last but not least, or speaker, the next speaker um, is uh, Mel Slater. Uh, Professor Mel Slater is a distinguished researcher here at the University of, Neuro, uh, of uh, Neuroscience. He was previously a professor of uh, computer science and virtual reality at the University College London, and he is the co-director of the event lab where they test uh, virtual environment here from the Institute of Neuroscience. Um, 
Dr. Merslater has been working in the field of virtual reality since the early 90s, and he's really an international renowned expert in the field. He holds an ERC advanced grant, which for the ones that you don't know what it is, for the researchers to be. This is the single most uh, prestigious award that you can have in, Euro in Europe as a researcher. So I think that together with uh, Eduard Vieta and Mel Slater were very happy and, and thankful in the Institute of Neuroscience to have this top level of world lead class researchers. So I'm, I'm very happy also to say that I have started some collaboration with Mel and I'm really looking forward to hear your talk. Thank you very much, Mel. Thank you. So thank you for that introduction. Um, one morning my slides were moved at the last minute from a Mac to a PC, so I'm looking forward to see how they are. So I'm going to talk about how virtual reality might be used to um, address issues in cognitive neuroscience and psychology. And the topic I chose to talk about was illusory or vicarious agency in virtual reality. So uh, my talk is first I'm going to mention about body ownership in virtual reality, then the idea of agency, look at a particular model called the Ford model of agency, then how we address virtual, uh, very vicarious agency in virtual reality, and then some conclusions. So first of all about body ownership or body transformation. A body transformation illusion usually occurs when there's multi-sensory data that, the, that involves a contradiction that the brain resolves by producing the illusion, and this is a famous one. So the subject is the one behind with his eyes closed, and the experimenter is tapping his nose, and she's also moving his finger to tap the nose of the one in front. So the brain doesn't like confusion. It integrates this synchronous touch of the nose and the finger into one overall percept, I'm touching my nose. The problem is the arm is outstretched. So how does the brain resolve this? It produces this illusion that the nose has grown very long. I can't explain how this illusion feels, but maybe later you can go into groups of threes and try it yourself. This is a more famous one called the rubber hand illusion, where the hand on the left is a rubber hand. The one on the right is the person's real hand that they can't see. It's in behind a barrier. And the experimenters touching and stroking synchronously the rubber hand and the real hand. And after a few seconds of this stimulation, the rubber hand begins to feel like it's your hand, the proprioception shifts to the rubber hand. So this is based on a paper in Nature in 1998, and it's had like maybe 10,000 citations. So this is how we do it in virtual reality. Um, the subject is tracked in real time. They look down, they see a virtual body substituting their real body. They move, and <clears throat> they move and the body moves with them. So again, it's multi-sensory multi integration, but this time it's visual motor rather than visual tactile. And most people, again, get the strong illusion this is their body. Of course, they know it's not true, but it's, an, it's a perceptual illusion. So there's overwhelming evidence that our body representation is highly malleable. As Armel and Ramachandran wrote, taken collectively, our experiments suggest that the so-called body image, despite all its appearance of durability and permanence, is a transitory internal construct, a temporary shell that can be profoundly altered by the stimulus contingencies and correlations that one encounters. In other words, the continuous multisensory evidence gives the brain cues, this is my body or this is part of my body, and this can change very dramatically. So now on to agency. Agency is the self-attribution of an action. I move my arm and I say, yeah, it's me who moved my arm. So it's long been known, though, that you can also have illusory agency or vicarious agency. And in this, this is due to Wegner. In this experiment, the subject puts her hands behind her back and a confederate puts her hands underneath the arms of the subject and critically, the experimenter says, move your arms. And the arms that move are the confederate's arms, but nevertheless, the subject feels, I've moved my arms. So the question we ask is, what happens when you have body ownership over a virtual body that does something that you didn't do? So we had participants embodied in a life-size virtual body, and that body moved synchronously with their own movements or asynchronously. In the first case, they get high body ownership. In the second case, they don't. Then at a certain moment, the body spoke 45 words. 
and the fundamental frequency of the voice was higher than that of the participant. So first of all, we measure the fundamental frequency of the subject's voice. Then they have the VR exposure towards the end of the exposure, synchronously or asynchronously. Then towards the end of the exposure, the, vo the body speaks. The stimulus voice has a higher fundamental frequency. Then they take off the head-mounted display, and then we measure the fundamental frequency of the voice again. And the variable of interest is the fundamental frequency after compared with before. Back. So um, I'll sh I, one thing I can't yes. do here, I think, is or maybe I, oh yeah, I can move the video forward a bit. So this is the subject. Um, this so is the, the synchronous condition. Doesn't Very matter what she's saying, but the vo the body is the, the subject's not saying anything. It's the virtual body that's saying it. Casa. And in the asynchronous condition, everything's the same, yes. but the body doesn't move with you. So the findings were that there's much greater perception, illusion, and body ownership in the synchronous condition, as we would expect. Also, much greater illusion of agency over the speaking, even though the subject didn't speak at all. And most interestingly, the fundamental frequency of their voice after the experiment was greater than before, just like the fundamental frequency of the voice that spoke was higher than theirs. When they later spoke, their own voice took on that fundamental frequency. And this is compared with those in the asynchronous condition where none of these things happened. So there's, a mod there's several models of agency, but a popular one is this forward one, very simply put here. It starts with an intention to act, like you're told, move your arm. You have an intention to do it. Then there's the motor command. The motor system uh, figures out the movement, the and then the sensory system sees the, uh, or experiences the sensory sensory um, outputs of what your move calls, the sensory outputs of what your move calls. But at the same time, there's an efference copy which does a forward dynamic model and predicts what the sensory outcome should be. And if the actual sensory outcome and the predicted sensory outcome are the same, yes, it was me who did the action. But if they don't, then you have, there's a, a problem. You say, no, it wasn't me who did the action. However, in our scenario, there was no prior intention to act. The body just spoke. No one knew that the body was going to speak. So uh, our explanation is that if this is my body, body ownership, and it is doing action X, then it must be me who's doing X. The brain prepares then continue to do that action X, so it does the motor commands to do that action X. The motor commands are prepared to realize the action that matches X, and when the participant in this case later speaks, the speaking conforms to the properties of X. But this isn't just body ownership, because we did another study where, where we induced body ownership not by visual motor, but by visual tactile. And then when we got, we got that, yes, you still get the illusory agency when the body speaks, but there was no behavioral after effect. So the behavioral after effect is coming from a generalization of the real agency. Casa. I move my body and it moves Mes. to the agency caused by the, uh, that's caused when the body starts speaking. So also you can do this with not just speaking, but here we, we did one with uh, walking. So the participant is seated in a chair, and they look down and they see a virtual body, and their virtual body goes out for a walk. And this is uh, uh, the condition where the body uh, is seen from the first person perspective. And ultimately, the body walks up a hill. And when the body walks up a hill, in this condition, people get aroused, their heart starts beating faster and so on, even though they're just seated in a chair and their virtual body is the one that's moving. And then in another condition, we did the same, but it's a third-person perspective. If I can show a bit of that. So everything is the same, but you see the body walking beside you, and then these things don't happen. You don't get agency over the walking, and also when it goes up the hill, you don't get the, uh, the uh, physiological responses. We also applied the same idea of illusory agency to a psychological condition, this is people with persecutory thoughts, not clinical. And when people have persecutory thoughts, paranoia, they engage in self-protection behaviors, and they don't like interacting with other people because it makes that they think other people are thinking bad thoughts about them. So we considered whether agency over a virtual body, their virtual body that was seen to interact with other people, would reduce their persecutory thoughts. 
So participants were embodied in a look-alike virtual body. They were asked to go out and interact with groups in a crowd. And first their virtual body double did this, so they didn't do it themselves. In a random condition, the body double never went to any of the crowd. And in the targeted condition, it did the task correctly. It went and talked to people in the crowd. And then the participant actually did it. So if I, again, wind this forward a bit, First of all, the person's embodied in a virtual body that really looks like them, and then this is just practice of moving, and then they... Observe su doble e imagínese... They're, usted, they're told, go out and interact with the crowd, and their virtual body separates from them and goes out and does it, and starts talking to the members of the crowd. And then uh, in the random condition, the virtual body never approaches the, uh, the people in the crowd. If I can doesn't really matter, you just see a virtual body and it never really approaches the people in the crowd. And then afterwards, the person is told, go out and talk to people in the crowd. So the results were high levels of body ownership and agency over the virtual body, even though it separates from you. Um, there was internal consistency between all the measures of paranoia that we used. And in the targeted condition, this was associated with a reduction in one of the paranoia scores one week after the exposure compared with the first measure that we did one week before. So just by seeing your virtual body go out and do something that normally causes you anxiety, it helped these people to get over this problem. Of course, it's non-clinical sample and a small sample size and so on, but it was very encouraging results. So in conclusion, virtual reality offers an excellent tool for the study of body representation because unlike in real life, in virtual reality, we can change your body. So studies and agency can be carried out that will be difficult to do in physical reality. It's just one example of a kind of cognitive neuroscience problem that can be studied. So what we found here is the Ford model is not a complete picture of how agency worked because uh, there was no intention to act in our experiment. And we can generate vicarious agency without any command to act. And therefore, this is how we see that the Ford model is not complete. Of course, what we haven't done in our group is to know anything about the associated neural activity, but this is very much an open question. So this work is uh, mainly funded by, well, almost is completely funded by European Union, and this is uh, the people in, in the group. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mel. Great. Great talk, great presentation. So we have some time for questions. Is there any question in the room? No, so I have one question. Um, how long do you think it will take to translate this to the clinic in the sense that uh, I still, I mean, this is spectacular, but it feels that this has to be done in a super control experimental setting. How do you see, foresee this in the future? Maybe t developments in technology will help a lot. Yes. So, I mean, so one of the biggest areas of research in the last 30 years in virtual reality is in uh, clinical psychology. And there's been many, many, many studies, many experiments successful. We, we've been involved in some ourselves. And the difference now with a few years ago is now the a sophisticated head-mounted display costs the same or less than a s smartphone. So there's absolute, in terms of cost, and you don't need a lab or anything, you could just do it here. You, know, you can do it anywhere. So in terms of expense and so on, the expense is producing the scenarios no longer in the equipment. So it's perfectly possible now for, uh, as there are many companies actually in the world, to, to use virtual reality in, their, in psychological treatment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's one question there, Christina. Well, I, I'm quite concerned about, I mean, <laughs> Ethically talking, no. Uh, also about uh, what Pieta just presented, it's, it's quite scary to know that people, well, people we don't know who can really record everything we are doing, and now you can you tell us you can even uh, change our behavior. Yes, um, actually, um, on that one of the ethical dangers of the metaverse that uh, um, Meta is pushing is that. If they collect all the data which is possible in virtual reality, so you know where someone's looking, you know what they're looking at, when they look, 
they could be wearing the kind of things that Professor Vieta was saying of, they can, you can know what's going on uh, physiologically with them. So you get massive amount of data of what's, how stimuli affect people. And if companies collect all this data and then use machine learning on it, they can predict both at the individual level and the mass level exactly what people, or more or less exactly what people are going to do in response to which stimuli. So this is a very important ethical concern. We have a project funded by Ministry of Science here in Spain where we're looking at some of these issues like get it, will people confuse reality, virtual reality? Uh, can they be persuaded to do something they wouldn't normally do? We don't know the answer. There's a lot of speculation, but there's no data. Then my question will be like going ahead. How can we avoid that? So how can, not, not ethically talking, but if as a person I don't want to confuse my body or my way of thinking with the machine, can somehow say, okay, no, stop it, you know? So how can I, I don't know, if I'm a video gamer, say this is reality, this is not, and even in the, in the worst scenario where, you know, the machine is so powerful that you really, it's difficult to, to, to separate, there are any tools for the person to say, okay, no, this is not me? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is very difficult because if you put in virtual reality a warning saying none of this is really happening, none of, then the virtual reality is not going to work at all. So it's very, I mean, it's going to be a, a higher level, but the same like in movies. You can watch a movie that can change you and there's no advance warning about that. So it's a very difficult area, I don't know the answer, but uh, I'm in some European committee which is looking at this thing of responsible communication. Nobody really knows the answers to all these things, but it's a very important question. Okay, so Brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all of you for, and now we have a plenary session.